I think this is history four, isn't it? I think it's history four. But I wanted to start off with, um, I just wanted to say, I love the fact that in, was it history one, where, whenever it was, where I was at history two, I started talking about the careers guidance and, you know, having to listen to that when all you wanted to do was go and make music and, but it appears anyway that in some interview a long time ago, I, can't, I do remember saying it now, but I'm not sure if it were true, but I still, it's still funny. The fact that in an interview, it stated that we had said, uh, me and Rob in particular, that our careers guidance had said um, we were going to be gardeners, which of course is what I've been doing for six years. So I just love the irony of the fact that I went on that rant and they were actually kind of right. Or certainly, if we believe what was ever quoted in that interview anyway, um, it, you know, they're right, but they were right, but I don't remember saying that. I think, they, I don't know. Anyway, I just thought it was funny. Someone pointed it out to me in the um, kind of, it was YouTube or the Twitter comments. So what I'm going to make this video about, it should be another what's going on really, because there's, there's all sorts of stuff happening for, for me at the moment. It's insane, but... I want to keep to doing these videos and telling the stories and stuff as much, you know, um, I want to keep doing it. So certainly getting back to before things really kicked off for us and all the lead up to everything that happened for us on, you know, the first EPs and that and Fierce Panda, even before all, I know it was after Fierce Panda actually, would well, have been after the Fierce Panda thing came out, I think anyway, there's aspects of, you know, when the, the exact timeline that blurred for me, but one thing that stood out for me was our first meetings with record company people, A and R men, people who were trying to sign us. You know what I mean? People who showed a great interest in the band and actually wanted to sign us. Because you know, it's one thing having people come to gigs and say, "Oh, hey, great," and all that stuff or whatever. But you know, it got to the point where we were, you know, having meetings with you know record company people. So you know very important in the industry, record company people from, from all the big labels. And it was, it was, it was, it was amazing. But again, with the, with the, how coalition drip fed us into it, it felt all felt so natural. It was never overwhelming. And I think one thing that we always did actually, and this ties into the story is we never let the occasion be bigger than our banter. And that's a perfect lead into the story, really. I guess it didn't matter the importance of whoever we were with, you know, whatever the repercussions may, might be, you know, our banter and how we communicated with each other was always above that. Because I, think, I guess, you know, still at that point, we were just creating this stuff locked away and these people were really desperate to come and meet us. So they could meet us on our terms. And that also plays into the story. I hope I can remember this enough or I should have made notes, but um, you know, got to do it on our terms. So let's see how I can lead into this properly. So yeah, anyone who's ever spent any time in those, especially in those early days, in the really early days, you know, we were like one thing, you know what I mean? We just, we moved together. Just, uh, a brilliant unity, you know what I mean? A brilliant cohesion, not only musically, that extended into our banter, because don't get me wrong. So one thing that, you know, we all, I've said before, we all have different personalities and we could all quite easily get drawn into, you know, um, disagreements with each other, never, never physical, but quite easily get into, you know, disagreements over certain points. So. A lot of the time, especially when we were doing that sort of thing, like photo shoots or interviews or talking to record company executives, we'd just, we'd still just have our childish banter. And we, you know, we were kids. We were kids quite the way into it. Our first trip in Japan, I'll never forget that time. We, we, we were in that, um, we were in a minivan. We were just like a, you know, um, an anonymous sort of driver, just a driver for a company. And we were just having that much of a laugh. And it was quite obviously a very professional sort of stateless guy, you know what I mean? Very, you know, not paying attention to us. And we were just having so much of a laugh that he just, he just burst into fits of giggles and I'll never forget that. So our, our banter was infectious and people loved getting involved in it, um, you know, all the time. And I loved that about it. It was, you know, having people come into, 
there's too much to t- you know there's too much to talk about in terms of that. I've got a million stories to talk about in terms of and even extending the metaphor physically in terms of people getting involved and in games of frisbee in America that turned that and started with two people and ended up with like twenty or thirty people at night with a, with a frisbee with lights on it. I got another funny story about that same frisbee actually. I still got that frisbee. That were all Lollapalooza, that frisbee game, which were. I'll never forget that, I felt like Tony the Tiger. Honestly, we, it were Lollapalooza, so all the buses were in massive car parks. So, you know, after we'd all, you know, when everyone were doing whatever they were doing, all the bands and that were kicking about or whoever, long short of it is, we start playing frisbee. Me and Mick Quinn, I hope you watch these videos, Mick. I really hope you watch these videos. And I hope you remember this moment, because you got, you got as involved as I did, mate, honestly. You know, me and Mick started playing with this frisbee with the lights on it. In fact, that's where I got it. That's right, no. So on the, on, oh God. Yeah, so on that, that game of, that, the frisbee wasn't mine at that point. The frisbee wasn't mine at that point. Me and Mick got involved in this game of frisbee with loads of other people. So it was only small at first, and then loads of other people got involved. And it, like I said, it went to night and it had lights on it. And then it got down to it where I think there was only me and Mick and the guy who owned the frisbee still playing after it sort of died down a bit. And at the end of it, I, I didn't know the guy we were playing frisbee with. It was me and Mick, we didn't know him. At the end of it, he came over to me and he gave me the frisbee and said, you know, thanks, I really, I really love that because I think, well, me and Mick really helped get people involved because I was diving about like a mentalist, ADHD. Tons of energy, do you know what I mean? Tons of it. And I'm tall and I can reach, so it was proper, it was ace. And it was still night as well, so that frisbee, it just went like an absolute arrow. Um, that's, that's probably one of my best memories of this America, is that it were, and we've got how long to be played for? And wait till we get to extreme hot potato. Wait till I get to that. It's too much sometimes, honestly. It's too much sometimes, I mean, or sort of, Mm, all that up there, but where did I go with that? Oh, oh, the frisbee, the frisbee game, getting the frisbee. I think it was such a good game. Yeah, I love that stuff. I love. It was a perfect evening. I don't know. I can't remember where we were. Maybe Mick Quinn, who does seem to have a really good memory. Maybe he'll he'll be able to remember exactly where we were. Um, but it was a still night, perfect, and it was gorgeous weather and. We were all just playing this frisbee and, you know, parsley, of course, you know, and you have to run off and do a really quick, a really quick, you know, gorilla parsley roll. <sighs> um, but, and, you know, everyone else on whatever, because I never really, really drank that much. I always preferred parsley, to be honest. Never really got into the, into drinking. It never, never agreed with me. But anyway, I'm not going into that. So yeah, you know, just a beautiful evening, a gorgeous memory of that, and all these people. There must have been 30. Again, Mick might be able to help me with those facts. But anyone, any more to tell on that? I'll stop myself there, I'll watch this back later, and I'll develop that, because Lollapalooza's got to have its own video. On video? It'll probably have its own, I'd estimate about five or six hours, so that's probably what, one, two, three, five, a few. Right, so this video was me wanting to talk about our gang our gang, basically, and that might even be what I end up bracketing this episode as, because that's what we were, we were a gang. And it's one of the most special bonds I've ever been involved in. Um, yeah, no doubt about that, it's one of the most special, especially at that time, especially in those first, you know, well before the second album really. All the lead up to the first album, touring the first album. That was amazing. It got difficult from the second album onwards, but that's a lot more videos, isn't it? A lot more videos away. So, as I say, we're talking about our gang mentality and we're talking about our first record company meetings with executives. <coughs> right. Which ones do I want to tell first? Well, let's start. Difficult, really. I mean, the one that sticks out in my mind, there's been a few of these, but. Yeah, alright, I'll go with this one first. So, I need that, I don't know why I'm putting it there. First one that sticks out in my mind is going to be the record company meeting with 
RCA, sure it was RCA, that's Sony Columbia, I don't know, I can't remember, I don't think I even knew then, I didn't care, I didn't care, really, that was Tim Tony, Rob, that was the management, that was Coalition's job to know if that were right, and that, I don't know if you saw in my other video, that, that, that document that the Coalition made, it's, that talks about all the deals, I should have that, I should have that on mix, over there, probably about, I could probably really, I could kick a football that far, well, maybe not quite. Anyway, it's not that far, it's over there. Um, I knew that would happen. What was I thinking about? He'll mm -hmm. come back to me. Come on, Bray. If you can football, I can throw it to there because of the record company contract thing. Right. So, yeah. Right. It, it, I think it was literally the first one. Was that our first meeting with a record company person? I think it was. Tim came up with him. Did we pick him up? Did they get a taxi? Can't quite remember that. Stu might remember that. Mm, can't quite remember. Anyway, was it just Tim? Did Tim and Tony come up? Tim, Tony and Rob? I have to say, I'm pretty sure I only remember Tim being at that meeting. Anyway, we had the meeting at Checkers in Ledsham. I hope I got that right. Which is the pub where us four used to go, you know, and have you know steak sarnies really, well i haven't been for a long time did a really nice steak sarny down there so we, we, we were there so the guy and i'm sorry i can't remember his name i can remember some names well some lots of others but i think it was the only time we did met him because we ended up going with with hope with virgin but anyway it was a lovely bloke it was really it was a really nice bloke and as i say i have to be careful sometimes because when i've been introduced to people in the past i make friends with people really fast and sometimes other people around me, I think, tend to think that my friendships I make with people affect my decision making in terms of is this someone we should be working with. So, um, you know, I don't know why I said that, but anyway, uh, I like the guy. He was a really nice guy. He was a really nice guy. But so, and it was a great meeting. It was a great meeting, and you know, we just talked about. We talked about all the kinds of things you'd expect us to talk about and he was saying how he felt about our music and what he felt it could do, all these sorts of things. But the thing that sticks out in my mind is again, no, we would never let anything override our world, our bubble, absolutely impenetrable. And not that we had disagreements, but if for any reason we had some sort of disagreement over anything and we were in a circumstance, we didn't care, you know, we'd be like, well, what? So anyway, now I need to remember who was on which side of the fence here. I guess it's not really that important. It became a, a, a sort of a, is it a theological question, is that the word? Philosophical, theological, I don't know, probably not that wrong. It became, no, philosophical, that's how I'm going. It became almost a philosophical question and I can't remember, I'm sure it was Phil. I'm sure Phil was the one who asked the question. Now the question was, could you knock out a cow with your bare hands, with your fists? That was the question. So again, you know, any question like that in our bubble, there's no such thing as a silly question in our bubble. It was, it was talked about and analysed and you know, you have to consider the, the structure of a, a cow's head and its skull and how thick it is and against the, you know. And we, we talked about this stuff and, you know, we got quite into it and then we were like, well, you know, Mike Tyson then, could Mike Tyson knock out a cow? And then you're like, well, how do you knock something out? It's effectively the brain shaking inside the skull, technically. That's, that's what it's going to take to cause that temporary, uh, you know, core functions motor functions out cold so we're like could Mike Tyson I don't think no well of course Anthony Joshua wasn't the scene then how old will Anthony Joshua have been then that's the point someone will probably put in the comments how old will Anthony Joshua have been in 2000 and this will have been what 2001 two maybe one probably one anyway so yeah we're like you know could Mike Tyson knock out a cow and that became a very a strongly fought battle did that over this table in checkers with this very you know very uh, very well respected well to do record company a and r and you know who was wanting to sign us expressing you know his seriousness in signing us and we we got we got carried away and absorbed in the question of whether you could indeed knock out a cow with your bare hands and it did it got to me not in a bad way that the, the question got to me 
Do you know what I mean? I literally thought, well, obviously it's going to, you know, like a, what, like a three month old calf? Could you knock out a calf? Do you know what I mean? All these sorts of things. Not that I want to. Look, I'd never knock out an animal. Gee, well, look, that's a completely separate issue, but no, I mean, my love of animals is extreme. You know, I, I, I love animals. I'd never, ever, ever hurt an animal. And that's something I feel I've got to say when I talk about knocking out cows because actually thinking about it now makes me sick because it's, you know, anyway, this video is not about that. It is about at that moment in time. And at that moment in time, I still want to knock down a cow. No, I still want to knock down a cow. Or thought about suggesting someone should. Look, anyone who's cruel to animals, um, I could, I just wish they'd one day see me, you know what I mean? But anyway, but anyway, that's a totally different conversation again. So yeah, we 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 got really involved in could we could we um, could we knock out this cow? And like I say, it got to a point where this this chap was sort of stood was sat there eating his food and watching the dynamic of this conversation. And as I say, I'd love to be able to remember who was on which side of the argument. I'm sure I said no. I'm sure I was saying you you, you won't be able to knock out a cow. You know, you break your wrist, you break your arm, you break every finger before. It didn't even really know what was going on, but again, I don't want to do it. But that that is an example of where we were, what we thought about the world and everything, and what Tim loved about us, the fact that we just we were impenetrable to bullshit. <laughs> not to not to link the two, but we were we were impenetrable to it at that point. Because it didn't matter, it didn't change anything. You know, we never started this to make money or be massive. So all these people talking about you to be massive and all this stuff didn't mean anything to us. It didn't change anything. And Tim made sure of that. Tim, Tony and Rob, um, they made sure of that. So, you know, we didn't really care. We just thought, well, you know, we'll talk about whatever we want. And that's what we did in that meeting. It was hilarious. And it got to the point, I'm sure, you know, like, well, come on, let's play your cows down, do you? You know, we'll try it. Well, we'll stop. And go on, you can try and knock out a cow. Yeah, and see how we get on tomorrow. You know, doing any day-to-day -day -day tasks with, because I mean, you know, unless you really know where to, where to place it, um, I, I, just, I still don't know about that, mate. I certainly would never try because for reasons I've already stated, it's, it's an abhorrent thing to even think about doing that and think about it, but at the same time, I've never risked, I won't risk getting my hand. I need these, more than ever. Well, even if I'm gardening or whatever I'm doing, but I need them. So how long is this? 17. Which ones will I go for next? Oh god, there's enough. Let's do the spy scales ball. Yeah, alright. So that was our CA checkers and uh, knocking out a cow. The other one is um <coughs> excuse me. The other one is XL. XL, yeah. Excel records, basement jacks were big at the time, basement jacks were on there. Who else were on there? Were the Prodigy on Excel? Who else was on Excel that were really good? Um, anyway, I think Bad the Drawn Boy were on Excel, weren't they? Although, just remember people are on Excel now. Uh, anyway, so yeah, we met him in a place in town. I remember where it was exactly, don't know what that is now, and I can't remember the name of it then, don't matter. But again, similarly, and again, we, we weren't arrogant, but we were, we were investigative, shall we say. Is that, is that the right word? No, probably not. Militantly investigative about people's credentials, certainly. I mean, I've always left that kind of thing to Phil. Phil's always been very good at that, you know. Um, just asking people straight up questions, but in a way that makes it so, they have to give straight up answers or it's blatantly obvious to everyone that they're not giving straight up answers. And so yeah, and I would always be me, I've, I'm, I've, you know, I'm, in, I'm intense to this day. I'm an intense experience on so many levels. Um, but weirdly enough, when I talk to this camera, um, and I, I never, it never seems to, a problem for me, which I think I enjoy massively, because I do end up, well, as I say in that song, going to ground, um, shake off the past again, I hope it's left me with some dignity, do you know what I mean, because that's kind of me, do something 
reflect, think, oh. and then think, well, I hope, you know, I hope that's not too bad. I hope it left me with some dignity because certainly with the bipolar aspect as well, I mean, I can go from this to a million in a split second and then back down again. <laughs> People close to me actually find it quite funny really because I'll be talking like this, something will happen like a fly on oil me and I will just go absolutely insane until it's out of my eye line and then carry on absolutely normally. But anyway, where have I gone? Where have I gone? Yeah, so yeah, I would intense. I would intense. Stu, uh, Stu had his luck, you know what I mean? Stu had his luck and Stu, as he would probably say, he's never been <clears throat> he's never been one for the for grilling people. Um, you know, Stu likes to sit back, let us do it, and then he'll give us his thoughts based on everything that he's heard. And I like that. It gives a level of it gives a level of sane analytics to it. Do you know what I mean? Because I think the rest of us, especially at that time, especially at that time, the rest of us were me and Phil. I think me and Phil were intimidating. Not sort of physically, but in terms of, you know, if you want something from us, you're going to have to work your way into the gang and me and him are going to make it really difficult for you. As I say, Stu would sit back and Rob, um, you know, Rob, Rob's an incredibly charming person and he always was then, he is now. So his role in grilling people who were trying to impress us was different to, you know, mine and Phil's and it was different to Stu's as well. Um, I don't know whether I'd put... No, I, you know, I think Rob, whereas me and Phil, under the right circumstances, or the wrong circumstances, could be that intense, Rob would offer similar points and opinions, just in a much more calm way, basically, and a much more charming way. So they'd be, like, sweating when me and Phil were talking to them, and then Rob would start talking, and they'd be like, oh, thank God, do you know what I mean, just for a minute, because Rob's going to say something that doesn't make me feel like I've... Do you know what I mean? Anyway, that's how we were back then. And I don't think Phil would make any bones about that either. You know, Phil's grown a lot, as have I, as have Rob, as have Stu, as has anyone that goes from the ages that we have to what we are now. We've all grown a lot. I don't think anyone would disagree with what I just said, really, you know. Um, we were all different people back then. But So the XL meeting, anyway, the XL meeting was similar to the RCA one, and I think it was RCA. I might be wrong about that. I'd have to double-check, but it's certainly three initial B and G. Yeah. Anyway, I look in the box. So the XL one, in a very similar situation, our banter over, 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 I want to say our banter over, over, it's not overwrought, it's not overwritten, it's not overwrited, it's not overwrought. Do you know what I mean? What the, maybe it is overwrought? I don't know, I'm not saying that word, I don't like it. So anyway, our banter was more important than the weather that we were meeting, much more important. So this time, oh, that's right, that's right. Again, I'm sorry, I, well, I'm sure I'm not watching this video, but anyway, what am I talking about? But the guy from XL Records, I can't recall his name at the time, he made the mistake, he made the mistake of saying, um, especially at that time, he made the mistake of saying that he liked the Spice Girls. Well, to us, you know, you It wasn't the best thing to say, really. Because we didn't have the bigger picture at that point. Obviously Tim and Tony did, but we didn't have the bigger picture at that point about any of this stuff. But of course, if you turn around to us at that point and say, yeah, I feel like the Spice Girls, yeah, it's good tunes. You're like, what? And you want us to be on your label? Do you know what I mean? That's just because he liked the Spice Girls. It wasn't reflective of anything other than the fact that the reality is they wrote catch it, well, whoever, you know, they, it was catchy pop music at the time, you know, which is obviously a mature reflection when you can say, well, because at that time we went savage on him. Obviously not too savage, but we were, you know, we roasted him. Absolutely roasted him like the spice water. Do you know what I mean? Fuel, fuel to our fire. But that sort of stuff brought us together. You know, that brought us together. And there's lots of other stories I can tell like this with certain individuals telling us stuff not coming true. And then us dealing with it. Well, not dealing with it, but having the chance to put our point across anyway on our turf. That was always fun. But yeah, so we got... Uh, so it wasn't between ourselves, this argument. I actually remember now it was actually with the, the chat from Excel. And it wasn't really an argument, but it was, it was an example of us, again, 
almost being militant in our approach to how music should be made, watched, listened to, consumed. We have a lot of opinions when we didn't need to. But we knew that. We knew we didn't really need to because we had great people advising us. And that was why we were allowed to flourish. That's why we were allowed to flourish as a band. Um, really. Certainly. All the stuff that Coalition that Tim, you know. I, I still hold Tim. Obviously, Tim sort of found us first. Who knows what would have happened otherwise. But no, I, I know. We'd have gone on to university and drifted apart and got to 30 and thought, hey, let's reform and play. You know, we didn't do that. You know, we got in, Tim, I'm pretty sure Tim might correct me, I don't know if he watches these videos, but I'm pretty sure Tim discovered us just off the back of him being involved at a PR level with Urban Hymns, being involved and sort of going along the journey with the Verve. I'm sure I'm right there. I could be wrong and I apologise, but, you know, Tim came off that journey with the Verve and Urban Hymns, I think, and into what we were doing and he discovered us. And obviously Tony Perry and Rob Partridge and everyone brought so much more to the table but there's no doubt that Tim was the man who discovered us at first <clears throat> and he was the man that listen he was the one at these meetings he was the well I say he was the same one he would have been just as animated in discussing the physical you know realities of whether you could actually knock out a cow and he would have been involved in the Spice Girls conversation and I'm pretty sure he would have sided with the XL chat by saying well you know come on it's pop music we don't need to be talking about this we saw it deeper than that. We saw it as, um, I suppose it's like if you're a football, you know, if you're, you know, whatever football fan you are of whatever team, it's, you know, it's like suddenly having your best mate come up to you and reveal a rival strip. I don't know. It's like, what? what? Spice Girls? People used to call me Charlotte Church. Was it Paul Simeon? Not Paul Simeon, that's the Paul Simington. What's his name? Reyes, Phil. Organise, tell me Ray is his name. Sure, it's Paul. I can't remember. Anyway. But he, he dubbed me Charlotte Church once because when I get like excited about a point, I do, you know, like I just did before. I'm not going to try and replicate it now. You know, like it'll, it'll have to happen naturally. I did all this stuff. But yeah, my voice goes up anyway. <coughs> and I remember he said something, and I said something, and he went, you yeah, know, Charlotte Church. I spun round like, what? And then I thought, that's yeah, funny actually. I was, you know, very defensive back then, very sensitive to everything. God, absolutely everything. But I love that lad, Paul. I, I just know he was Reyes. I just... I just... Oh my God. I mean, it just reminded me of one of the most cringeworthy moments I've ever had on stage. With, a, you know, with the music or, you know, I've never been on stage with anyone else, but... So Paul was our merch guy. He joined the American tour with Kasabian as our merch guy. What's his name? Come on. Paul, I can't remember, but it's not Paul Simeon because he's from the Clash he, or someone. I don't know. I might be right. Anyway, I'm not, that's going to really stop me from telling this story. But I should save it to someone else, I guess. I might do, you know, I might save it for a podcast now. So I'll tell a bit of it because there's lots more to it. Basically, it ended up where, for ages on this tour, we, you know, Paul, he was a lovely lad. We really got on with him absolutely in the gang instantly. Do you know what I mean? Even though he did call me Charlotte Church on the first day. But it was my first, you know, I don't know. I mean, depending on how far all this goes, I'd love to do some sort of podcast with him about my first meeting with him. Because my first meeting with him was intense, actually. Not through any fault of his own. I was in an incredibly bad place. Going out on that American tour. I'm sure I sat in the airport looking at the timetable crying and John O, who was David Bowie's sound engineer, John O, he came over and sat there and went, you okay? And I'm like, no. I'm not. Whew, that's cold. So the first day we were there, we were in New York and I can't remember where everyone was. I remember being alone. No one else was there. They may have, might have been at the day room. I don't know. Anyway, I went to the, I was at the venue, effectively, you know, early doors, quite early, and Paul was obviously there really setting up his merch. I'd never met him before. So I was in the dressing room area being, well, trying to stay together, as I did on that entire tour, I tried to stay together. I did it on lots in the end. But certainly on that one, certainly on that one, um, 
Oh, God, I'm so many stories about him. Never go with this. Certainly on that one. Come on, I'm nearly there. Will me to do it, will me to do it. Yeah. Certainly on that one, I was having a hard time. I didn't want to be there. So I was in the dressing room having a moment, shall we say, in inverted commas, and in walked Reyes, or Paul. Um, and I was a bit like, obviously taken aback because I were, you know, having a moment, come on. And I didn't know Paul. So I was a bit like, you know, who the, are you? <clears throat> I don't think I said that to him, but I, I probably made it more than clear I wasn't happy about his presence. Totally unfairly, obviously, totally unfairly. But you know, when you're in that bad a place and a stranger discovers you, although the look on his face was one of warmth, it wasn't one of what the fuck, do you know what I mean? It was one of, who is this guy that I've just walked into not being very happy about that? But, um, yeah, I think I was quite rude to him for not very long until I realised that he's one of the nicest blokes I've ever met. Oh dear. So yeah, so anyway, we got really pally with him, part of the gang, and it, you know, we, we, he fancied himself as a bit of a dancer. He, he fancied himself as a bit of a dancer, and we were like, you know, get on stage, get on stage at some point. I'm going to cut this story short now. It's 31 minutes. Get on stage at some point. So anyway, one night, where was it? Texas. It was. It was Texas. Went about. Austin went next night. Anyway, don't really matter. We're in Texas. So, what part of the song we're at again? Don't matter. But he gets on. Anyway, we arrange it. He comes out. He gets on stage. And he starts dancing anyway. I mean, let's just say that A, he couldn't dance. B, he got stage fright, and C, well, yeah, he got the X Factor, put it that way, bless him, as a dancer, as a human, Jesus, he's really got the X Factor and more, but not as a dancer, and it, I can't remember how long you were on stage, let me try and think, let me try and think how long I would have realistically tolerated him doing what he was doing on the stage, try and think. Here he comes out. About that long. I think it was about that long before I was like, do you know what I mean? I think he knew himself though. I don't think he were entirely comfortable. Did look great, but in reality, he just looked like a stage inventor. Do you know what I mean? He just looked like someone who forces his way onto the stage. Oh, and I've got a lot of funny stories about them. So not quite as funny. But I've got a lot of funny stories about them. But I think that's going to be enough for now. 33 minutes. I really enjoyed making this video, actually. It's been fun. Oh, oh, I'm supposed to be on a call with someone. Oh, God. Sorry, Ricardo. I'll, um, I might be late. I might not. I've no idea what time it is. Uh, uh, anyway, thank you very much for watching still. And um, I'm really excited about what's going on. So no doubt I'll make another video soon because I really like doing it. So there. Uh...